Come on. All right, special senses. These are, come on, y'all know I hate this thing. Wow. 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 Okay, there you go. All right, so the special senses. What we're talking about are uh, is vision, hearing, equilibrium, uh, smell, and taste. Those are your special senses. These, that means basically these require a complex type of receptor. Okay, it's not just a simple mechanoreceptor. It requires some kind of complexity uh, in order for you to perceive or ha or have this sensation. So these are your special senses. And we're going to start off with the eye and vision. Now, when you talk about the brain, uh, or the eye, actually 70% of all the sensory receptors, everything, think about all the sensory receptors in your entire body are located in your eye. So there's a lot of receptors. Your, your visual field is huge, and it takes up a large portion of your brain. If you go back and look at that brain picture, a large portion of the brain has to do with uh, perception of vision, processing of vision, visual acuity, and things like that. Almost half of the cerebral cortex processes your visual information. So we, we get a lot of information from our eyes, okay? We use that a lot. Uh, our eye is very protected. It's, in, it's wrapped around, uh, it's got fat and muscles, and then it's inside the uh, orbit of the eye. If you remember back from the bone unit, there's a bunch of bones that form, I think there's seven bones that form the orbit of the eye. So it's not just one eye bone. You've got those seven bones that fuse together to make the orbit of the eye. And the receptor type are photoreceptors, which means they respond to light. Okay, so these are the, that's the type of receptors in your, uh, in your eye. Kind of the outside view of the eye, just kind of review from what we did in lab. Here's, your, of course, your eye. The white part, let's see. Here we go. The white part is the sclera. And it's actually covered with a really thin membrane called the conjunctiva. Uh, you couldn't see that on the model, but that's actually a little thin layer over the sclera. Uh, that word sound familiar to you? Conjunctivitis, our pink eye. So that's the little thin layer over the uh, sclera. You have your pupil, which is the dark center, which can constrict and dilate and allow more or less light in. The, the clear area over the, I don't know this, let's just not, yeah, it is. Here's the cornea. The cornea is that clear area over the colored part, which is the iris. The iris is the colored part. We have uh, over here, has our lacry it's called the lacrimal caruncle. That's that little piece of flesh you see right over there. It covers the tear duct or gland? Duct. duct. And where's the tear gland? Oh, Up in here. All right, very good. So that's kind of what we talked about last week as far as the basic anatomy of the eye. Do a cross section and look inside the eye. Here we have our cornea, our pupil, our lens, and you can see these little papil these little muscles that help uh, reshape the lens as you try to focus. You have the retina along the back. Here's your optic nerve. Um, it's also filled with fluids. You have fluids uh, inside the uh, eyeball. You have the vitreous humor and you have the aqueous humor. We're not going to talk about those too much, but they're basically there is fluid inside the eye. So when you have things like glaucoma, um, have you ever had the little thing, the test where they puff the air at your eye? They're basically trying to see how much uh, pressure is inside the eye. They're measuring kind of that uh, vitreous humor pressure inside your eye. Um, let's see. The path of light, basically light comes in this way, okay? It is basically focused by the cornea onto the lens. Then the lens focuses that image onto the retina. You have receptors back here. They then send their signal out the optic nerve and into the brain. Um, there's a really uh, short section in your book on the physics of that. If you're interested in how you have the little man, here's your image. It focuses on your lens then it gets turned upside down. If you're interested in that, by all means, read it. I'm not going to lecture on that, but that's basically what's going on. I mean, you probably guys have had that in high school or whatever. But it's in your book if you're interested in the physics of how vision works. We're not going to talk so much about the physics as much as we are the physiology. Um, another thing when you're talking about uh, needing to wear glasses or whatever, this little image, when it's focused on the retina, what's happening is if you're nearsighted or farsighted, 
basically the lens and the cornea aren't quite uh, in line like they need to be. They're not quite bulged or, or the shape's not quite the way it needs to be. And basically your focal point, it doesn't project the image onto the retina. It's either in front of the retina or actually behind the retina. So that gives you kind of that, um, that either being farsighted or nearsighted. Again, if you want to look in the physics of it, it's in your book. Um, I don't go over that a whole lot. Uh, what I want you to notice is the pathway of light. This usually kind of blows people's minds. So here comes light. Here's the retina. Okay, all this is the retina. The, um, this is actually, this area through here is actually transparent. Okay? And this is where your actual photoreceptors are located. These are your photoreceptors. So light has to pass through this area to the photoreceptors. Okay? In this area of the retina of your photoreceptors, you have the cones, and then you have, these are the rods. All right, so you have rods and cones. Uh, way, or light, are just wavelengths, okay? Just different wavelengths of energy makes up light. So particular wavelengths will cause particular cells to fire, either the rods or the cones. Do you remember which ones are color and which ones are black and white? Color for cones, black and white, or dark, or rods. So depending on the type of light, that uh, the wavelength, each one of these uh, cells will fire. When they fire, they will send their signal this way. Okay, so the signal then binds these bipolar cells. You see these are bipolar cells. <laughs> then they synapse with another set of cells, ganglion cells. Then all this information comes together and then goes out the optic nerve. All right, so, it's, so the pathway of light is this way. The pathway of information is this way. That's just kind of cool. All right, so when you focus uh, light, basically the light comes into the eye. It's got to go through the cornea, through the aqueous humor, which is between the cornea and the lens, then through the lens, then through the vitreous humor, which is all the fluid inside the eyeball. Then it goes through that transparent layer, that neural layer of the retina, then it hits the photoreceptors, okay? Uh, in order to focus, you have to refract the light. That allows you to focus. And so you use your cornea and you use your lens. So when you're using contacts, basically, or you're having uh, laser surgery, you're reshaping the cornea. So contacts, uh, and, and glasses, basically, that's trying to refocus the light on the cornea before it goes into the lens. Let's see. Okay. So when we have our photoreceptors, that means we're responding to visible light. Okay, that's just uh, wavelengths of energy. And that's going back to physics. You've never had physics, and you probably have no idea what I'm talking about. But basically, light comes in little wavelengths. And we have little bitty wavelengths and big wavelengths. And then we have what's called the color of the rainbow. That's, what, that's the visible spectrum. That's what we see. We can see color. That's the, the part of the electromagnetic spe spectrum that we can see. That's the visible spectrum. So our rods and cones only respond to that. That means we don't see x-rays. We don't see gamma rays. There's other light out there. We only see the visible spectrum, okay? Now, there's some creatures out there that can respond to other parts of that spectrum. We're just the humans only respond to that part. Okay. The rods are very sensitive to dim light, so it's your night vision. Okay. We also use it for peripheral vision. It's our black and white, so we see things in, in uh, gray. That's why at night everything looks black and white or gray. Okay? But it's not very acute. It's kind of fuzzy. Have you ever gone out at night and you, you can kind of see a general shape, but you can't make out details? Okay? So you have a fuzzy image, but you don't have an acute image. Okay? The other thing about night, uh, the rods is they, can, they are your peripheral vision. Okay? So things out here, that's your rods picking up on that. They're picking up on your uh, peripheral vision. Anybody out there like to watch, look, look at stars? All right, let me ask you this. When you go outside and you look at a star, can you see it a little bit better if you look away from it? You ever talk, you're, you have any idea what I'm talking about? 
Spe- at night, if, you, if you're trying to focus on something at night, so like so, like so, go out and look, at, try to find see a find a bright star, and then try to see a, a lighter star next to it. If you look at the bright star, then focus your attention on the lighter star, it may actually disappear. But if you'll keep looking at the the brighter star or something else, the stuff in the side will start to show up. So one of the things about night vision is a lot of times instead of looking straight at something, if you'll look off to the side just a little bit, it'll actually come into clearer focus because we use our night vision and our rods for peripheral vision. So a lot of times at night, if you look at dark stuff, look a little bit to the side and it'll actually be a little bit clearer than trying to focus directly on it. That's how you can kind of have more acute night vision. The cones, they respond to bright light. Okay, and they respond to color. There's different uh, radi- uh, electromagnetic, electri- electro, uh, ultraviolet, what am I saying? Visible light. I keep using the wrong physics term. Visible light. Visible uh, uh, waves that the cones respond to. Okay, and this gives us our color and our very detailed high resolution vision. Now, we're able to see in bright light and dark light, and we're going to kind of talk about how that happens. It's called light adaptation. When you move from darkness to bright light, okay, so you're laying in there asleep, and all of a sudden your kid walks in and turns on every light, and you're kind of, you know, oh, you're a little bit blind for a second, aren't you? You're a little bit blind. Large amounts of pigments are broken down, uh, and I'll talk about what, ha- what happens there, and you get glare. Let me go on to, well, let me do this. At night or in the dark, your rods have a pigment called, I should have changed the order of these slides, rhodopsin. Okay? That's a pigment that accumulates in the rods of your eyes and it is really sensitive to low low light and allows you to see at night um, so you have all this pigment in your eye this it's rhodopsin in your eye allowing you to see at night when you turn on a light that rhodopsin basically disappears it's broken down immediately it's really sensitive to light it breaks down and when that happens you get glare so it takes just a second for your pupils to constrict okay and allow those photoreceptors, those cones, to kick in because you've been in night vision, you've been in rod vision, and it takes just a second for the rods to basically turn off and the cones to turn on. So that's why you get, when you walk outside and the sun's bright and everything looks glary, and then just a few seconds later you can see, that's a physiological thing. You've got to turn off your your rods and turn on your cones, okay? And that happens... um, you ever notice you go to the beach, you walk outside, and you can't see for 10, 15 minutes, your eyes are water, and you're doing like this, and then all of a sudden you can see. And it doesn't matter. It's not any brighter than it was before, but your eyes have adapted to it. That's called light adaptation. You do the opposite when you go from light to dark. All right? Again, you've got those rods, okay? And when you walk, uh, say you're in your house, you walk outside, Total dark, turn out all the lights outside. Can you see anything? What if you just hang out outside for a little while? Can you see better? So what you're doing is you are building up that pigment called rhodopsin. It takes a little while for it to accumulate, about 20 or 30 minutes. So when you go outside or turn out the light and you have darkness, this rhodopsin will accumulate inside the rods. And once it's fully accumulated, you have your full uh, night vision, but it takes a while. All right, as soon as you turn on light, though, it's gone. Breaks down that rhodopsin. Okay, so if you're out there wanting to stargaze and you've finally, uh, finally got your rhodopsin going and you're able to see all the beautiful stars and then your daughter comes out and flips on the floodlights, it's over. you got to start all over again, okay, because you've just basically taken that. Does it sound like that's happened before? Yeah. So that's what's going on. So your pupils will dilate, your rhodopsin will accumulate, and you'll be able to see really, really well. Especially on like a moonlit night, man, you can really see after about 20, 30 minutes, you'll be surprised at how well you can see. Um, A really cool thing to test your dark adaptation is to, especially with your kids, um, is to get uh, wintergreen lifesavers. You ever done this? No, I'm talking about, yeah. 
So go into a, a dark closet, turn out all the lights, and take a wintergreen lifesaver and chew it, okay, and see if anything happens. Just right off the bat, do that. Probably nothing will happen, all right? Hang out in the closet for maybe five or ten more minutes, then do it. Wintergreen lifesavers actually spark, okay? There's a little chemical reaction. It's a little phosphorescence. It looks like little glow-in-the-dark sparks in your mouth. You won't see them if you go in there and turn off the light immediately. If you'll wait about five or ten minutes, it's like fireworks show in your mouth. Your kids, will, your kids will be, like, so impressed. It's really cool. It's fun to do. So that will kind of prove to you that you are able to see better after about five or ten minutes. Okay? And that's dark adaptation. And we do that every day when the lights go out. That's why you can get up in the middle of the night and be able to see. You've basically built up your rhodopsin. All right. So let's just, this is just real basic. Um, the retina, that's where the photoreceptors are. Okay, so this is the neural pathway. So the, the light hits the retina, hits those rods and cones, sends information from the retina, and it should say optic nerve here. So let's throw in the optic nerve. Then it goes through the thalamus. What did I call the thalamus? The sorting center. That sorts and edits the information, sends it to the cortex of the occipital lobe, and this is where your perception of vision. So this is where your processing goes on. This is where you actually perceive it. So from the retina to the optic nerve, through the thalamus, and then to the occipital lobe of the cerebral cortex. All right, so that's all we have to do on vision. Again, there's an entire section in your book talking about farsightedness, nearsightedness, visual acuity. Um, I'm not going to test you on that, but if you're interested in it, by all means, that's in your book if, you're, if, you're wanting, if you want to learn about that. Um, the chemical senses. The chemical senses are taste and smell. We use the word olfaction for smell. Uh, sometimes you'll see taste is gustatory. So those are your uh, chemical senses. Chemical senses mean that you have to break down the chemical in some kind of an aqueous solution, okay? So you have chemoreceptors, okay? That means they bind to a chemical that's been broken down in an aqueous solution. So let's just kind of brainstorm real quick. Um, taste receptors, what aqueous solution are you breaking it down into? Saliva. Saliva, yeah. And smell. Remember what I talked about? What happens when you smell? What's happening when you breathe in? What are you doing? You're spinning that air, warming it, and moisturizing it, right? So when you breathe in, you spin that air, warm it, and moisturize it. Humid, the humidity in your nose will basically break down those, chemo, those chemicals so that your chemoreceptors can bind to it and you'll have smell. These work together. Most of your ability to taste has to do with your ability to smell, okay? Uh, if you smell a food, you'll know what it's going to taste like. So if you have a cold or if you're stuffed up or you've, you know, uh, you won't taste food quite the same. Uh, you women know what I'm talking about. Have you ever gone and cleaned your bathroom with bleach and then you can't smell anything the rest of the day? <laughs> you basically burned out your nasal receptors that day. And so then food just doesn't taste the same the rest of the day. Or if you have a cold, what do you do? You want to go put hot sauce on it or lots of salt or something. You want to make it spicy because you just can't taste it when you have a cold. So smell and taste go together. You've got to have smell to have a acute uh, sense of taste. Yeah, yeah. If you have to eat something nasty, you'll like, you know, close your nose so you won't smell it. All right, so the or <coughs> organ of smell, that's just, uh, there's olfactory epithelium, epithelial uh, tissue in the roof of the nasal cavity. And they have olfactory receptors or smell receptors, which are chemoreceptors. And they send their information to cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve. So you have uh, the smell comes in, binds to those olfactory receptors, and sends its signal to the olfactory uh, the olfactory cranial nerve number one. So here's the air. It's got the little chemicals in it. You breathe it in, swirl it around, warm it, moisturize it. The chemicals are now dissolved or solubilized in the nasal uh, mucosa. They bind those receptors, cause those to fire, send the signal through the cranial nerve one to the brain, and you have smell.
You have to dissolve those chemicals in order for them to bind. And you have little cilia on those, uh, on those membranes. So it binds those little uh, cilia on those membranes. Um, this is a little bit of a slower uh, activation on the postsynaptic side than, than a typical neurotransmitter. You've got to use that G protein. Remember when I said you use a G protein, you've got to start some kind of a cascade, right? So this is a little bit slower of a reaction than just a neuromuscular junction, neurotransmitter type of a reaction. You don't have to remember the cascade. Just know that you use a G protein, you get that second messenger, and that second messenger then affects those channels, okay? You're starting to change that sodium and calcium channel, you get depolarization, you get the action potential, blah, 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 blah. It's a little bit slower than a straight neurotransmitter binding to a, uh, an ion channel and causing depolarization, you know, quickly. It's a little bit slower. Um, here's the pathway. Basically, your olf olfactory receptors synapse with the uh, olfactory bulb. That centers the olfactory cortex. And this these interact, the olfactory uh, cortex interacts, I'm going to put it like a double, double arrow, with the hypothalamus, the amygdala, and the limbic system, limbic system. These have to do with what? Do you remember? Emotion. So smell is typically an emotional response. When we smell something, it's either pleasurable or, you know, dangerous or a warning signal or smells bad, but we usually have an emotional response to smell, just about always. Very, very rarely do you have some kind of ooh or ooh reaction to something that smells, okay? Um, I remember that word that I was trying to remember in lab the other day. <laughs> I knew I would. All right, so when you smell something, um, let's say you're cooking dinner and, and you've been cooking chili all afternoon, it's been in the pot, and you smelled it at first, okay? And now it's been in there a couple hours, it's still, you know, it's doing its thing. And your husband walks in, mmm, that smells good. Oh, can you smell it? Because you can't smell it anymore. Have you ever noticed that? If you do something, you just can't smell it anymore. It's called sensory adaptation. Adapt. Adaptation. So that means basically those receptors have been, been bound, okay, and they're still being bound, but your brain is kind of, it's got, it's old news. It knows that. It doesn't need to know that anymore. So it just kind of tones that down. It doesn't respond to it anymore. Because what you want to do is you want your brain to be able to respond to a new smell if it needs to. It doesn't need to be overwhelmed with an old smell. It needs to be prepped and ready to go if you need to have a warning signal or something like that. So you have the same thing uh, with hearing. Have you ever noticed if you're uh, somewhere where there's a loud noise, and at first you're like, man, that's loud. But then after a little while, you don't even notice it anymore. You just kind of, it just, you know, it doesn't bother you. Like I can be, the TV can be on, and at first I can't do anything but watch TV, but eventually I can be reading, and I don't even, it's background noise. Same thing. You have sensory adaptation with hearing just as well. Same thing with taste. You may uh, eat something really, really spicy, and the first bite is, <sighs> but then the next bite, you know, you finally, you pretty much burned out your taste buds, they don't respond anymore, and it doesn't really bother you anymore. So you have this thing called sensory adaptation, and that occurs with smell and hearing and taste. And that's just basically, you don't respond to a sensation any, any longer. Okay, so taste, where's the sense of taste? That's in your taste buds, okay, and that's where you have these chemoreceptors. And they're on the tops of those papilla. We have the fungiform papilla, the little dots on your tongue, the foliate papilla, and the circumvallate papilla. Okay? That's where you find your taste buds. And I've got that picture that I showed you in lab. Here's your fungiform. Remember fungiform means mushroom, fungus. Looks like little mushrooms. You have the foliate. Looks like little uh, leaves. And then again, I deleted my circumvallate. are these, okay? And these are where your, uh, your taste buds or your chemoreceptors are located. 
we have five sensations of taste, okay? Now, remember, taste is made up of a combination of these five, okay? So if you eat something that has complex flavors, uh, you're, you're, you're tasting a mixture of the sweet, the sour, the salty, the bitter, maybe the umami. You're, very few things are, all, are just one or the other. I mean, maybe a, a popsicle is maybe all sweet, or obviously table salt is all salty, but most foods are a mixture of all of these. Um, and you have to throw in smell. <laughs> smell affects the way things taste. The five taste sensations are sweet, sour, salt, bitter, and umami. All right. Um, each one of these chemoreceptors binds to a different chemical. Okay, so if it's a sweet receptor, it binds to a sugar. Only a sugar will bind, cause it to fire, and give you that uh, taste of sweet. If it's sour, it's hydrogen ions. What things are typically sour? Things that have a what? A, a low pH, yeah. Things that are acidic tend to be sour. Things with low pH, low pH means they have a lot of hydrogen ions. A lot of hydrogen ions will bind to the receptors and you get the, idea, the uh, perception of sour, like a le uh, lemon. Lemons are acidic, and we perceive that as sour. Uh, your salts, you respond to the metal ion. Remember most of your salts, sodium chloride, potassium. I did this in lab for those of you who are wondering why I'm saying you remember because I talked about this in lab. Uh, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, these are actually metals. They bind to the receptors, and you perceive salt. If you perceive uh, bitter, it's usually something alkaline, okay? with a high pH, something uh, alkaline is typically bitter. And then last but not least, you have umami, which I call it meat taste, <laughs> for lack of a better way to describe it, is your meat taste. Uh, meat is made of protein. Proteins are made of amino acids. Guess what? Amino acids are what bind to umami and you get, their, you get, that, uh, you get those taste buds firing. All right, in order for you to have taste, you've got to dissolve that chemical in saliva, and it's got to uh, contact those hairs. So this has got cilia as well. You'll notice that a lot of the sensory, special sense, um, special senses contain some kind of cilia. All right. When that chemical, be it salt or hydrogen ions or sugar, will bind the receptor, and that will cause that cell to depolarize, <laughs> That will then release a neurotransmitter, and then that neurotransmitter will generate an action potential. So it's kind of similar to the neuromuscular junction, just a little bit different. You've got to have something bind the taste cell first. And I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm not really t uh, concerned about you remember, rememberizing all the steps of this. I just want you to know basically that taste is a chemical you got to dissolve it, it's got to bind a cilia, and then you get an actual potential, okay? Got it. Got it. Um, oh, we can skip. I already talked about this. I forgot I had this slide in here. Uh, okay, so if you have sodium, that's salt, hydrogen, sour, we got that. We already, we already covered that. Okay, so how does that pathway, uh, what's the gustatory pathway or the taste path pathway? Uh, you have two cranial nerves involved. What does that stand for? All right, seven's what? And nine? <laughs> Facial and glossopharyngeal. All right, so they're the ones that carry the information. They both innervate the tongue. They're going to carry that information to the cerebral medulla. Okay. Then they go to the thalamus. Remember, everything goes through the thalamus. Then it goes to the gustatory cortex, the part of your uh, cerebral cortex that is involved in a uh, taste. And again, taste will involve the limbic system because, again, taste 
usually elicit some kind of an emotional response. Mmm, that tastes good. Or, ew, that's nasty. Okay, you have some kind of emotional response to taste as well as smell. All right, 80% <clears throat> of what you taste depends on smell. Okay? The other sensations on taste have to do with temperature. Is it hot? Like burns your tongue, like in, you know, physically hot. Um, mechanoreceptors. Is it you know hard to chew? Sometimes if you're chewing something for a long, long time and it's kind of pressing down, you just you know you don't like it. Like I don't like um, octopus. You have to chew it all day long. It's just not pleasant. Um, also, the temperature. I mean, the texture. I mean, there's some people who just don't like certain textures of foods. Like, my daughter really doesn't like ground beef. She thinks that's just, she says, I don't like the texture. You know, she likes it in a hamburger, but she doesn't like it when you put it in, um, like, in spaghetti sauce and lasagna. When you have the little bitty balls of ground beef, she just thinks that's a weird texture. And she's not a picky eater. That girl eat anything. Uh, but she doesn't really like the texture of ground beef. And I know a lot of people have a texture issue. Um, and that's a lot of times an issue, too, with autistic children. You know, it's really hard to get them to eat because they don't like certain textures. Because they're, you know, you'll notice with autistic children, a lot of times they have, they like to have something soft with them or something, but they really have a problem a lot of times with texture of food. And so that can tend to distract you or detract you or uh, enhance your, um, your pleasure uh, from food. Okay, last but not least, the ear. How are we doing? <clears throat> the ear is hearing and balance, or you can use the word equilibrium. We have three parts of the ear, external, middle, and internal. Okay? The external and middle ear are involved with hearing. The internal ear is both hearing and equilibrium. Okay, you have two types of respond, uh, receptors. You have receptors for hearing. You have receptors for balance. They don't respond to the same thing. Hearing, hearing uh, receptors and balance receptors are not the same. They don't respond to the same type of stimuli. They work independently. All right, so this is review from lab. Here's your external ear. You have the auricle and the helix and the lobule. You have your canal, external auditory meatus or external auditory meow, uh, canal. Here's your middle ear, which can, is composed of your tympanic membrane, your ossicles, which is your malleus, your incus, and your stapes. You have your pharyngeotympanic tube, also known as your eustachian tube. And then inside the skull, you have the internal ear, which has your cochlea your vestibule, and your semicircular canals. And I'm not going to go over these slides we did in the lab. All right, so this is breaking away uh, the inner ear. And here's your semicircular canals. You have three of them. Okay, here's the vestibule, and here's the cochlea. The cochlea, this section, back on it. The cochlea, okay, come on now, come on. Wow, dagummit. Don't do that. Okay, I'll change colors. All right, the cochlea <coughs> is hearing. So this is your hearing part. The vestibule and the semicircular canals, all this is equilibrium or balance. So two different structures, one for hearing, one for uh, equilibrium and balance. You'll notice you have two nerves. You have the vestibular nerve and the facial nerve. These are cranial nerves that come off of these. Okay, what is sound? Sound is just a wave, okay? It's basically a pressure wave. 
or a vibration. Okay? Sound goes in all directions. So we use our ear, this part of your ear is basically used to focus those sound waves toward your ear canal so it can go toward your tympanic membrane. Um, if you have a pet or a dog, when they're listening, what do they do? They cock their ears. They move their ears. They're actually moving their ears toward the sound to focus the sound waves into their ear canal so they can hear better. So that's what we do. Our ears actually work to uh, focus the sound into our ear. Um, a little bit of physics just to kind of talk about that. When uh, The way you hear different types of sound, whether or not it's high-pitched or low-pitched, depends on how fast the wavelength is coming. If it's a high frequency, means really quickly, quick, uh, quick um, wavelengths coming really fast, that's high-pitched. If they're more drawn out, that's low-pitched. So sound actually comes in waves. If they're really close together, it's a high-pitched sound like or oh, that's a low pitch, okay? The loudness is how high the amplitude is. So, you know, if it's really loud, it sounds higher, I mean uh, louder. If it's really low, it sounds softer. So you look at the amplitude. So if you had a graph and you did really fast, short amplitude, that'd be a really quiet, high-pitched sound, maybe something far off you can't really hear very well, or something really booming like the, the, the bass in the car next door. <laughs> be really high, but slow. That's the bass in the car next door, okay? Is that how you parse that? Yeah, that's how mine. Mine's, mine's more around right here. I have really good hearing. Um, I don't, my TV's down like on two. I can hear. That's why when you guys are talking, man, I'm here. I can hear what you're saying. <laughs> I have really good hearing. My daughter's like, how do you know that? I hear everything. All right. So let's talk about how sound causes you to, uh, to hear. This is basically the transmission of the sound. You've got to get the sound into the inner ear. So basically, take your outside of your ear, okay? You've got sound waves coming in. Focusing that sound, sound comes in and it vibrates the tympanic membrane. It hits that tympanic membrane, okay? That then causes the ossicles to vibrate, so the bones vibrate, all right? That, uh, as the bones vibrate, the stapes, it's that oval window, is underneath the stapes, you have an oval window, actually kind of pounds on that oval window, okay? It's kind of, kind of like knocking on a door, all right? And that causes that oval window to transduce that sound into the inner ear, all right? So the stapes pushing on the oval window, kind of pounding on the door, pushing that pressure wave into the inner ear. Now the inner ear is filled with fluid. So here's all kind of, this, all this blue stuff is fluid, all right? And you have this spiral organ of cordy, which is basically through here, all right? And you've got this fluid. As this, uh, as this pressure wave is going through this fluid, okay, it causes this thing to vibrate. It's that little membrane to start vibrating, all right? There are hairs associated with this membrane and as the pitch gets going and as this vibration gets going at just the right vibration speed, that will cause little hairs to bend and that's how you, uh, you hear. So um, when you lose your hearing, sometimes you have actually killed off some of those hair cells and they don't respond anymore. Especially if you've been exposed to really loud sounds for a long, long time, people that work in construction, uh, around airports or army, anytime there's really high percussion type sounds, will actually be so violent to the ear that it'll actually cause those hair cells to die. It'll just kill them off. So when that happens, you may lose an entire section of the ear of this, of this membrane that doesn't work anymore. Okay, all this works. You can maybe hear high pitch or maybe you can hear really low pitch, but you'll basically have a gap in your hearing. Okay, because certain parts of the, these little hair cells get killed and they don't come back. Once they're gone, they're gone. So you want to protect your hearing. If you tend to do anything, like you're when you walk around with your iPhone or your iPad, iPod in your ears at you know level 42, you know you're you're not going to hear when you get older. 
Huh? What are you doing? I can't hear you. So turn it down. Turn it down. Okay? If you mow the grass or use your leaf blower, put on some ear protection. If you hunt, if you do anything that's got loud noises for extended periods of time, even girls, a hair dryer. You're sitting there fashioning, blowing your hair. You're just killing off your hearing. Okay? Let your hair dry a little while. <laughs> Then style it with the hair, with the dryer, okay? Or use a straightener, but don't be blowing that hair dryer right in your ear. All right. <clears throat> so specific hair cells respond to specific pitches, okay? So that's all I want you to know. Specific hair cells will respond to specific uh, pitches. When these hairs bend, okay, here's your little hair cell. When they bend, they generate an action potential. And they will bend more if something's loud, okay? That's how you detect it. Basically, bends the hair more. So if something loud bends the hair more, kind of increases uh, the action potential. Um, we can also localize sound, okay? Because our ears, we have two on either side, okay? And so as the sound's coming to your ear, it's gonna hit one side a little bit faster. So if the sound's coming from this direction, okay? If it's coming front on, it's gonna hit me at the, at the same time. But say if a sound's coming from this direction, it's going to hit this ear before it hits this ear, okay? And it's just a millisecond different, but your brain can respond to that. And when your brain responds to that little bit of a delay from the sound hitting this ear and this ear, you know it came from that direction, okay? You're able to do that little, that little calculation. If I tried to tell you to do that calculation on paper, it's called physics, I would die. We had to do that when we were, when in physics. You had to calculate, you know, how you could perceive uh, direction of sound uh, using math, and that's not really very easy to do. But your brain does it without even thinking about it. Okay, so it's pretty cool what we're able to do. But when you try to figure it out, it's pretty difficult. Uh, like I said, I took the physics of physiology, and we had to basically figure out how how your brain can calculate, you know, that something's coming from the left or the right or behind you in that little millisecond delay. That's like four or five pages of math. I'm not going to make you do that. But your brain does it automatically, okay, which is pretty cool. You're a lot smarter than you thought you were, okay? All you guys that hate math, your brain's doing math all the time. You just don't realize it. My brain's not doing math 098. <laughs> Good? You got out of it or you not got it? Well, I got it all through. All right. Let's, <clears throat> let's, everybody keep our fingers crossed for Jesse. All right. Um... So that's hearing. Now, we also use the ear for equilibrium, orientation, to let us know where we are. All right, so we have receptors, basically, that monitor if things aren't moving, static equilibrium, everything's fine, everything's sustained, we're not moving, or, that's in the, vis in the vestibule, or we have the semicircular canal receptors, and they monitor dynamic equilibrium. You're moving, all right? Um, the way I like to think about this, the vestibular receptors, uh, they tend to fire off when you start to spin, okay? So when you start spinning, those receptors will, will, will pick up. Your semicircular canal receptors, they fire when you have, uh, let's, let's say angular movement, for lack of a better way to describe that. Like moving your head up and down and side to side. That makes sense. Move forward movement, backward movement, side to side movement. Moving your head back and forth, up and down, but not spinning. So they kind of respond to different things. All right. So here <coughs> is inside the vestibule. You have those ear rocks. I think I told most of you guys about. I talk about ear rocks. All right, so you've got the ear rocks inside that membrane. And as that membrane of ear rocks moves, it will bend these cilia, sending a signal. And we'll t your brain will, uh, will interpret that as movement. Okay, uh, it'll tell you which way your head is bending. All right, so you've got these hair cells. You've also got fluid inside the semicircular canals that as you bend your and move your head. Those also have little cells in here that as the fluid flows around it, those give your orientation. So this is orientation, uh, forward movement, backward movement, kind of your directional movement. All right? 
So here's those hair cells. Here's the ear rocks. This is when you're right, when you're straight up and down. When you start to bend, the little ear rock bends the cell, hair cell that way. When you bend this way, it bends the hair cell that way. Okay, and your brain can uh, basically interpret that as motion of your head. Don't go into all the details. Okay, that's just go with ear rocks, bend hair cells. That's all I, that's all I want you to know. All right, now inside the vestibule. Spinning. That spinning movement. You have what's called endolymph, which is basically a fluid, and you have a more cilia. There's got cilia again. All right. And as you move, think about uh, turning on a blender, and the, the the stuff starts to spin around. Okay. So as you start to move, that fluid starts to move. Okay, and it starts to make these hair cells move, and they will bend, and that gives you an idea of which way you're moving. So I've got a picture of a lady uh, ice skating. So here you go, straight up and down. You're not moving. You're not spinning. You start to spin. You get that endolymph spinning. That bends those hair cells, and that allows you to know that you're spinning. Okay, so you use all this information. You use the forward and backward movement of your head, the spinning a uh, sensation of your head, that gives you a really good idea of where you are, okay, what your location is. Are you static? Are you being perfectly still? Are you moving forward? Are you moving backwards? Are you moving side to side? Or, or are you spinning? All that's going on in your ear. Now, in order for you to know where you are, not only do you need your ear, you need your eye. Uh, when we get dizzy is when our brain and our eye do not match up anymore. When I'm standing here, when I'm sitting here, I'm looking out, my visual field tells me I'm upright, okay? And not only does my visual field tell me I'm upright, my ears tell me I'm upright. Everything's good with the world. When you start to spin, okay, or move quickly, have quick movement, especially think about being in a teacup or some of those goofy rides that spins you upside down, okay? Now your eyes are moving, your ears are moving. Everything's kind of moving and getting out of equilibrium, okay? Your eyes and your ears can't reconcile that anymore, <laughs> and that gives you that vertigo feeling, okay? You also have receptors from your skin and joints. When I'm standing here, okay, not only do my eyes tell me I'm straight up and down, my ears are telling me I'm straight up and down, but my position, my muscles and my joints are in a line, and I know I'm upright. Now, if I start to lean over, my visual field's now sideways, okay? My head's telling me I'm sideways, but I also feel stretch. I know I'm leaning sideways, okay? Same thing. If I'm leaning this way, my visual field's now shifted, my ears have shifted, and my stretch receptors have shifted. So we use all of that to tell us where we are. So if you just want to do an easy experiment, stand up, close your eyes, and what will you start to do? You'll start to sway. <laughs> I mean, everybody does it. Go, go to church. Everybody bows their head. Everybody starts doing this. Everybody starts holding on. Because you don't have that visual feel to make, you know, keep you straight up and down anymore. Amen. So you know that you have to have that visual feel uh, to, to, to write yourself. So we use all that information together to know where you are. So it's not just your ears. You've got to use your ears, your eyes, and also uh, the receptors from your body, your skin, your muscles, and your joints to get you uh, get your orientation right. All right. Is that it?